So these questions arose from the case of Justin Lee, who was investigated for drug offences. A summary of CMB's investigations was released on 22nd October 2021. They show, in essence, Justin Lee had been advertising the sale of LSD stamps, a Class A controlled drugs, on a messaging app. CMB officers did test buys of the drugs from him twice to verify that he was in fact selling the drugs. He was arrested on 3rd February. He was cooperative during his arrest and did not put up any struggle. CMB officers were not aware of any issues with Justin's mental health when he was arrested. His mother, Mrs. Cecilia Au, was present when Justin was escorted back to his house on 3rd February for follow-up anti-drug operations. The appropriate adult scheme for young suspects is used for suspects under the age of 16. The scheme, together with the age limit, had been announced publicly in January 2017. It was also discussed in Parliament in March 2017, where the age limit was made clear. Since Justin was 17 years old, there was no appropriate adult. However, the interviews CMB officers had with Justin were video recorded because of the seriousness of the drug trafficking offence he was being investigated for. The video recordings have been shown to his mother, Ms. Cecilia Au, on 22nd October 2021. We should add that there is also a separate appropriate adults scheme for persons with mental disabilities, in short, AAPMD. During the first video recorded interview, Justin mentioned to the investigation officer, I.O., that he had previously been diagnosed with depression. CMB proceeded with the interviews. Justin answered questions without any signs of distress and did not appear to be in need of any assistance. Justin was composed and coherent, able to logically articulate the flow of events, including sharing about his research on drugs and his trafficking modus, modus operandi. The I.O. assessed that he did not need to stop the interview to bring in an appropriate adult under the AAPMD scheme. However, as, started, as stated above, the interviews were video recorded. Justin was released on bail on 4th February after about a day in custody. His mother came to meet him and brought him back. Justin was charged on 23rd of June for drug trafficking offences under the Misuse of Drugs Act. He was released on bail on the same day, this was done with AGC advice. The next day, on 24th June, Justin was charged in court. The pro prosecution was ready to take the plea. Justin's defence counsel requested for adjournment. He did so a total of four times, so the case kept getting postponed. Finally, it was fixed for hearing on 23rd September. Throughout this period, Justin was out on bail, and as far as CNB is aware, he was at home. He fell to his death near his home on 16 September. Toxicology report from the Health Sciences Authority showed traces of LSD and nitrazepam in Justin's urine and blood when he fell to his death. This would indicate that he had taken these drugs, but this cannot be stated with finality and is subject to the coroner's findings. I have looked at this case and asked, why did this young person fall to his death when he was out on bail and was staying at home. 32 weeks, or about eight months, after he was arrested and released. 
It is very sad. The young man could have had a far better future. The question is, how can we bring across to more of our young people the danger of drugs? How can we also bring across to them and their families that even if they are arrested, they will still have opportunities to reform <clears throat> and the agencies will help them give up the drug taking and that there can be a good future ahead. We have been putting this message out quite a lot and will have to continue to do so. So that parents and the persons who are arrested understand the process. You have done wrong, but that does not have to be the final. Our system is designed to give second chances to help you rehabilitate. And many have succeeded. We have to get to that point. We have to get that point across. We change our laws on dealing with pure drug abusers to not treat them as criminals. Instead, we focus on getting them to change the drug habit. In Justin's case, he was trafficking drugs and seems like he was also abusing drugs. But with the right help, he could also have changed. And our processes are structured to provide the guidance and help after he's dealt with in court. We bring in the family into these efforts as well because without adequate family support, it is difficult to help the young persons. The young man had a lawyer. He was living with his family and the case was set to proceed in court. And after the hearing, if he was found guilty, he would then normally be put on a path to help him change, rehabilitate himself, as we said earlier. CMB had also made every possible facilitation for him. For example, bail. Usually suspects charged with drug trafficking offences will not be released on bail due to the high flight risk. However, in view of Justin's age, CNB released him on bail after serving the charges to him on 23rd June and allowed him to report to court the next day. So what made him jump to his death on 16 September when he was staying at home? As I said, this was some eight months after he had been arrested and released. What happened in those eight months? He had been charged and the case was fixed for hearing. What else happened? I think it is, it is difficult to say. Is it the fact that the case was coming on in seven days' time? Did he speak with anyone about the on oncoming case and his concerns? Were there other issues? How did he have traces of drugs in his blood? How is it that he appears to have consumed drugs before his fall. There are many questions, and it is difficult to do more than conjecture what the answers are. Now I will deal with the questions that have been asked. The questions relate to law enforcement agencies' protocols when conducting investigations. Ms. Sylvia Lim asked if we plan to review our protocols for dealing with young suspects and suspects with special needs. There are regular reviews to ensure that they are up to date. Ms. Denise Poir in 2016 and Ms. Lim in 2017 had asked if all persons under 18 can be supported with an appropriate adult during interviews. Given that the AAYS scheme applies to all persons under 16, the point really is whether it can be extended to persons who are 16 and 17. We have told both of them that this would be reviewed. There were some difficulties in expanding the scheme to suspects in this age group. And so we decided to operationalize the current process 
which was announced in 2017 for a period first, while we consider if and if so how we can deal with the issues. We will announce our decision in the next few months as to whether we can extend the AAYS scheme to persons who are 16 and 17 years old. Mr. Zukanen Abdul Rahim asked about CMB's protocols when conducting drug-related investigations involving young persons with a history of medical or mental health conditions. If it is made known to the officers that the subject has medical or mental health conditions and would require special attention, prior to bringing the person in to assist in the investigation, CMB officers will contact the parents or school first if operationally feasible. Under these circumstances, they will activate an, an appropriate adult to be present during the interview. If the subject displays any medical or special needs during the interview, officers will pause the investigation and activate support measures such as activating an appropriate adult or sending the person to the Institute of Mental Health for assessment. CNB will also obtain medical reports to assess if the subject is mentally fit for prosecution. If the person is observed to be capable of being interviewed, the officers will carry on with the interview. The point is that they will use their discretion based on their observation. Dr. Tan Wu Ming asked for statistics on persons under the age of 18 arrested who had a history of mental health conditions and those who subsequently were hospitalized or passed away. We do not track such data. It is also not meaningful for us to track it. These individuals may have passed away or been hospitalized due to varying reasons not related to the investigations, such as inherent health problems or injuries sustained by themselves. Regarding the outcomes of the investigations, out of 9,485 persons under 18 years old arrested from 2016 to 2020, only 16% were prosecuted. 84% were not prosecuted. I will emphasize this. Justin's case falls in the small minority of 16% because he was openly trafficking. The general approach when dealing with young suspects is to, where possible, avoid criminalizing their conduct, give them a second chance, and help them in their rehabilitation. Suitable youths who have been arrested for minor offenses can be referred to diversionary programs, such as the guidance program introduced in 1997 which has a strong focus on counselling and rehabilitation. Placing youth offenders on diversionary programmes allows them to be accountable for their action and prevents disruption in other areas of development, such as education. Justin will also have been placed on such processes after sentencing, if he had been found guilty. Dr. Shahira Abdullah asked how law enforcement agencies identify vulnerable persons and persons with mental disabilities. Training is given to our officers in this respect. The Home Team has also worked with the Agency of Integrated Care to increase officers' awareness for mental health conditions and help them to identify and respond to persons observed to have some mental health issues. In this, the officer will check if the person has a Developmental Disability Registry Identity Card issued by the National Council of Social, Services, so Social Service and CSS. Look out for information that the person may be undergoing treatment at healthcare institutions for diagnosed mental disabilities and observe the behavioural traits of the person. Dr. Shahira Abdullah also asked how family members of a young person whose death is suspected to be related to the person's interaction with the criminal justice system, can request for a formal investigation into the death. There are two possible scenarios here. First, the person may have been in official custody of a law enforcement agency at the time of death. Second, the person may be undergoing investigation 
and passed away subsequently due to suicide while not in custody. Under the Coroner's Act, both scenarios will be deemed as reportable deaths and the police must investigate the cause of, death, of the death. The police are required to report their findings to the coroner, who is a judicial officer appointed under the State Courts Act. In the first scenario, a coroner's inquiry must be held to determine the cause of and circumstances connected with the death. This is required by law. In the second scenario, it is, it is not mandatory to hold a coroner's inquiry. However, the coroner may still decide to hold an inquiry after considering other factors, including the desire of any member of the deceased immediate family to do so. Specific to Justin, we need to be clear. Justin was not in custody at the time of his passing away in September. He was in custody for investigation for about a day in February. Since his release on 4th of February, he had been staying at his home, except for one day in June when he was reported, where, when he reported to CMB and was charged in court. His is not a death in custody. Regarding Mr. Leong Man Wai's question on whether an appropriate adult was present during Justin's interviews, I've already answered it at the beginning of my reply. The member does not appear to be aware of previous announcements and discussions on the scheme. Thank you, sir.